is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-blessed God, whose presence is the happiness of every condition and whose favor hallows every relation, we ask you to be present and favorable unto these your servants, that they may be truly joined in the honorable estate of marriage in the covenant of their God. As you have brought them together in your providence, sanctify them by your Spirit, giving them a new frame of heart fit for their new estate, and enrich them with all grace, whereby they may enjoy the comforts, undergo the cares, endure the trials, and perform the duties of life together, as is becoming to Christians, under your heavenly guidance and protection, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Dearly beloved, we're gathered together here in the sight of God and in the presence of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted by God in the time of man's innocency, signifying unto us the mystical union that exists between Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee and is commended by St. Paul to be honorable among all men, and therefore is not to be by any entered into unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly to satisfy men's carnal lust and appetites, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God. Into this holy estate these two present come now to be joined, and if any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him speak now, or else hereafter and forever hold his peace. I charge you both, as you will answer in the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you knows any reason why you may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, that you do now confess it. For be you well assured that so many as are brought together otherwise than God's word doth allow are not joined together by God, neither is their marriage lawful. Timothy, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, cling only to her so long as you both shall live? I will. Jennifer, will you take this man to be your wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? And will you love him, honor him, cherish and comfort him in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep only unto him so long as you both shall live? Who gives this woman to be married to this man?
now the word of the Lord from Genesis 2. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to see Ad- to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused, a- caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Everyone is familiar with that passage that was just read in our hearing. We know that God created Adam and then tells him something that we might not expect if you had read Genesis chapter 1 and read straight on through Genesis 2. Remember in chapter 1, every, after every day's work, God judges the work of his hands and on each day he pronounces it good and on the sixth day he says it was all very good. But here in Genesis 2, God says something unexpected. He says that something is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. And this fact becomes the foundation for the creation of the woman who is to be a helper suitable for Adam. We learn here something that is ignored by more and more people in our day. And what we learn is this, that marriage is essential not only for man's well-being, but also for the well-being of the world. And that's not the way most people think in our day. Today we, we prize the imaginary freedom of being alone. We imagine ourselves to be independent and self-sufficient. And it's almost an insult if someone were to imply that you needed someone else to make you happy. Happiness is being able to live as you please, to do what you want, whenever you want, however you want, and not having to answer to anybody or be responsible for anybody or take anybody else's desires into consideration, not being beholden to anyone. That's supposedly true happiness. True happiness is being on your own, loving yourself and needing nobody else. The problem, of course, with that is that everyone who tries to live that way ends up in desperation and loneliness and deep misery. It doesn't work, and it doesn't work for a couple of reasons. It doesn't work, first of all, because you're a created being, which means that you're finite and dependent upon others. You're dependent upon God, of course, every moment, but you're dependent upon other people every day of your life. You never or independent, strictly speaking. But secondly, you're also created after God's image. And God, the true God, is not a solitary being, but he's a triune being. God is one eternal, uh, the one eternal God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three persons dwell together in perfect harmony and love. They make up a joyful, glorious, fruitful society of love and life. The Father loves the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit loves the the Son and the Father, and the Son loves the Spirit and the Father. Three persons, one God, three united in a holy society, a holy community of love. And this is why it's not good for you to be alone. Being created after the image of the triune God, you're a social being, and you need to live in communion with God and others if you're truly to live as you were meant to live as God's image bearers, if you're truly to be fully human. So God created a companion for Adam, someone who would teach him how to love and how to be like himself, someone for whom he would have to sacrifice himself like God sacrifices for us daily, someone who would give him the opportunity to learn to serve and become like God who serves us all the time. Adam had to grow in conformity to his creator, and this would happen as he lived faithfully, sacrificially, loving and serving the woman God had given him. And the same would be true of the, of the, of the woman that um, God gave to Adam. Marriage is essential for humans to learn how to be human, to be faithful image bearers of the living God. But there's more to this as well. Marriage is not simply for your blessing and your sanctification. 
But Paul, in Ephesians 5, tells us something more. He says that marriage is for the blessing of the world, the world that has been deceived by the lies of Satan and now really doesn't understand what true life, real life looks like. The world that's been blinded by sin and unbelief and held captive by the fear of death and needs to be delivered, that world needs the light of Jesus to scatter the darkness of unbelief. That world needs the truth of Jesus so that we can see through and recognize and expose the lies of Satan for what they are. And God intends that this great work of exposing the lie and shedding and scattering the darkness is going to be accomplished in part through faithful marriages between his people. And so he tells husbands to understand what it means to be given wives. And then he tells wives why it is that God has given them husbands. It's not merely for your private joy and encouragement and comfort. It is for the life of the world. And so Paul says, husbands, you have to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And wives, you have to honor your husbands by submitting to him just as the church submits to Christ and honors him. One of the primary purposes of marriage then is to proclaim this glorious reality of the gospel. That Jesus has come and has taken a people to himself. He loves them and they respond to his love. And as the world sees husbands loving their wives, giving up their lives for their wives' well-being, sacrificing in order to provide the needs of their wives and their households, and denying themselves uh, for the comfort of their wives, the world learns what it is, what it means in some measure for Jesus to love his people. And the world needs to see how his people, how God's people, ought to respond to the love of God. And one of the ways they learn that is by watching how wives respond to the love of their husbands, by seeking to honor them and serve them and giving up themselves for his well-being, giving of your time, giving your energy to building a home that is filled with joy and gladness and becoming the joyful mother of children. And so... As the world sees how we live together as husband and wife, they begin to learn what real life looks like. It's not a matter of serving yourself or seeking your own pleasure or doing your own will. Life means serving others, seeking to do good unto others and doing the will of God. Life means forgiving one another, showing mercy, bearing with one another's weaknesses and bearing one another's burdens, refusing to be bitter being patient and kind and generous, seeking to encourage rather than seeking revenge, seeking to strengthen rather than tearing down, seeking to give honor rather than to gather honor to yourself. Life means denying yourself, take up, taking up your cross and following Jesus, and anything less than that is death. And this is a vital witness for the gospel. For some people, watching how you live together as husband and wife will be their first exposure to this reality, that Jesus loves his church and the church honors him. Marriage then is an essential, essentially an evangelistic thing. It's, an, it's how we spread the gospel, one of the ways in which we do it. And that means that if you're unfaithful in your marriage, you not only end up injuring yourself, but you're going to cause a great deal of harm to the world around you. If you're lazy and worthless and a selfish husband who doesn't provide for his wife and is unfaithful to her, then you teach the world that terrible heresy that Jesus is unfaithful to his people. He doesn't provide for them. He breaks his promises. He leaves them helpless. And if you're a disrespectful, ungrateful, dishonorable wife who refuses to honor her husband, you teach the world that terrible heresy that it's okay for the church to disrespect Jesus and refuse to honor him in word and deed. Your marriage, then, is vital not only for your well-being, but you need to remember it's also important to the rest of us. And that's why we have a public ceremony like this. and We invite friends and family and everyone to come and join in so that they, we can join together and witness by our attendance and our participation and say what you two do today matters to us, not only to you, but to us and to the world at large. We have an interest in what you do today because what you do today and, what you, and how you live together hereafter will have eternal consequences for the kingdom and in our lives and in the lives of untold thousands of people. And that's why this is not just a nice ceremony. It's not just a mere tradition. It's not just an empty ritual. It's one of those important events. It's the most imp one of the most important events that is happening in the world today. 
you too are about to become one, and the world, for better or for worse, will never be the same after today. This is earth-changing, earth-shaking. So make it your business to make sure that what you do today is a blessing to the world around you. Love one another, serve one another with the goal of making things better for the rest of us as well as for you. That is, your calling as image bearers of the gracious God who has not left us alone and in our misery, but has given us his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have life and have it abundantly so that we will never be alone ever, ever again. Marriage isn't just for you. It's for the world. Let's pray. Most holy and most merciful Father, at once the God of all creation and the God of all grace, the creator, preserver, and redeemer of mankind, fill these, your servants, with a sense of the solemnity of the vows they are about to make. Enable them to remember and truly to keep the covenant they now enter into with one another and with you. May they look to you for your merciful assistance and enter into these sacred obligations in humble dependence upon your enabling grace. Grant this, O Father, with the forgiveness of our sins, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I, Timothy, take thee, Jennifer. I, Timothy, take thee, Jennifer. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and worship. To love, cherish, and worship. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge thee my troth. And thereto I pledge thee my troth. Okay. I, Jennifer, take thee, Timothy. I, Jennifer, take thee, Timothy. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and obey. To love, cherish, and obey. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge thee my troth. And thereto I pledge thee my troth. Is there a ring to signify and seal the vows that you have made? Yes. Okay, put it halfway on her finger. Now repeat after me. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. With my body I thee worship. With my body I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods I thee endow. And with all my worldly goods I thee endow. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. With my body I thee worship. With my body I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods I thee endow. And with all my worldly goods I thee endow. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Again, let us pray. Eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all grace, the author of everlasting life, Send your blessing upon these, your servants, this man and this woman whom we bless in your name, that as Isaac and Rebekah live faithfully together, so these two may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant between them made and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together and live according to your laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For as much as Jennifer and Timothy have consented together in holy wedlock through the making of vows before God and this congregation by virtue of the authority committed unto me by the Lord Jesus Christ and his church, I now declare them man and wife in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Timothy, you may kiss your wife. 
Okay. Now, face me. Face me. Good job. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Turn and face the congregation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Timothy Maney.
And you're all invited to the reception in the fellowship hall. Dismiss.